secret sixth finger on the Fistful of Fairy series. Hello, everybody. Welcome to What Magic Is This? I have a fantastic show for everybody today. Flashback to when I originally released the episode that introduced this whole series. I put it up on Twitter, and one of the first people to actually go, oh, that's interesting, was my guest today. They actually went, yes, yes. And I went, okay, that is interesting. And my guest today is Dr. Francis Young, who holds a PhD in history from the University of Cambridge and is the author of over 15 books, including Magic in Merlin's Realm, A History of Occult Politics in Britain, Magic as a Political Crime in Medieval and Early Modern England, as well as translated one of my absolute favorite grimoires, The Cambridge Book of Magic. He is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society, a reader for the Church of England, and routinely broadcasts for BBC Radio on History, Religion, and Folklore. Dr. Young, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for having me, having me on the show. My pleasure. So I put out this tweet and you went, yes, fairies. And I went, interesting. So that I guess, I guess Dr. Young really likes fairies. But it was maybe a day or two after that that I realized that you were going to be releasing a book about supernatural beings in England. And so I was like, oh, this is piquing my curiosity a little bit. And then not too long after that, you released a small little article with a fairly, I'm going to say, um, clickbaity title that goes like this. Everything you know about fairies is wrong. And so I clicked on this link and I read the entire, it's a short article. And uh, it certainly uh, it certainly made me go, well, I think I have to actually finally talk with Dr. Francis Young. So let's get right into it right away. Before we learn why everything we know about British fairies is wrong. Uh, I just want to ask you, would you say that the vast majority of folks' perceptions of fairies in the quote-unquote West is a relatively British conception? I think it is. I think when people think of fairies, they think of Britain, and perhaps to an even greater extent, they think of Ireland. I think if you say elves, they might think of Scandinavia. Um, right. But I think, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a word which is associated very much with the British Isles, even though, of course, that word fairy actually originally came from the French. Uh, so it's, a, it's an irony that it's a, a loan word into the English language, but it's become very much associated with Britain. Yeah. I, I have this question a little bit later on, but what is the actual translation? Because you say it comes from the French. Uh, what is the French root of fairy? There's debate about this, uh, okay. <laughs> exactly what the origin is. But I think that we can say that we, we're now in the right ballpark with regard to where the word comes from. So if you go back to the Roman era, there were a, a group of goddesses known as the Parci. The Parci are goddesses of fate. And the things that they said were the fata, the things uttered. And this is from the, the Latin verb fata, which means to, to utter, to speak. And this became associated with the Parci to the extent that they were sometimes known as the fati, as the ones who utter. And in fact, this word then becomes the word fate, fate meaning originally a word that is spoken over somebody that determines their destiny. But now, of course, that destiny meaning of fate has entirely taken over from that other meaning. And so over time, the, the, the fates become in French folklore, les fées, um, and les fées become then the fay in English. And then fairy is actually the realm of the fairies or the fairy kingdom. And so our word fairy is a bit of a misnomer. It's, we, we've taken that word fairy, referring to the realm of the fairies, and we've applied it to a type of being, a fairy. Uh, but actually, the older term in English is elf. So elf goes all the way back to Old English. And it wasn't until the 14th century that we start to see the appearance of the word fairy. Amazing. Well, I kind of wish that we we had this information right at the beginning of our series, but we're ending with it. You know what? It's the world of fairy. Things are backwards and forwards. It's a mirror of our own world. So 
Dr. Young, you have written a book that is called Twilight of the Godlings, and it is probably one of the first reassessments of the origins of British supernatural beings. Now, you said in this small little article that I read, the uh, Everything You Know About Fairies is Wrong, that the discussion of the folkloric and mythological origins of fairies over the last 200 years is a somewhat fraught one. Now, why do you think that this is? It's something which has been very divisive at times. If you go back to the 19th century, when people started discussing in earnest where fairy belief comes from, uh, there, there were two main schools of thought, really. And one school of thought is, is now very controversial because I think it, it, it links in with racialized and colonialized ideas of, of the 19th century. And that was what's sometimes known as pygmy theory. And this was the idea that fairy law was a dim memory over centuries of peoples who had been pushed to the margins by invaders. And those peoples had then shrunk in stature, gone to live in caves and, and, and under hills where they reverted to this sort of Stone Age existence and stopped using metal, for example. And then they would come out and try and abduct the children of the settlers who were living in these places. Uh, and so this was an inspiration for quite a lot of writers in the 19th century, very popular motif among horror writers and writers of weird fiction in this era. That was one theory. And then the other theory was in some ways quite similar, but not really focused on a real group of people. And that was the idea that the fairies were diminished gods or degenerated gods. And so there were, you know, pantheons of pagan deities, which were suppressed by the Christian church as a result of conversion, but the deities hung on and were diminished and became smaller and smaller, literally smaller and smaller, in terms of the idea of fairies being portrayed as these diminutive people. And so the fairies are basically these uh, shrunken gods, if you like. And those, those were, broadly speaking, the two main schools of thought in the 19th century. Fast forward a bit to the 20th century, and by the 1950s, the 1960s, the dominant English folklorist of the era, or and certainly the dominant scholar of fairy lore of the era, Catherine Briggs, had come to the conclusion that the fairies were probably neither of those things, and they were most likely to be a dim memory of a cult of the ancestors, a cult of the dead, that was particularly associated with features like barrows and burial mounds in, in, in England and Ireland. And so her theory was that the ghosts, that the fairies are a kind of bastardized version of that Neolithic cult of the ancestors, but still something very, very ancient and going way back. Interesting. So I have to ask, in so, in other words, you, so you saw this territory that was completely unexamined and besides people like Ronald Hutton putting up, I don't know, it's like a 15 page little essay. And you just said, let's do this. Have you always been interested in fairies and supernatural beings, Dr. Young? Or is it is it one of those things where it's just like this? This is something we should probably look at a little bit closer. Why, why did you why did you take this on? Oh, I've been fascinated with fairies since uh, childhood. Uh, okay, um, good. And I, I, as a child, I used to collect fairy books of fairy tales. Um, and I, I, I earnestly wanted to see them and I never did. Uh, but certainly, yeah, I was, I was very, very interested. And as a teenager, these things faded away. And, and, you know, I, I, I decided that it was a rather childish interest that I probably shouldn't pursue. But, um, as with many other things, uh, as I've got older, I've come back to the idea that some of the things that I thought were childish interests actually were the most interesting things after all. And so I'm, yeah, quite unashamed in my interest in it now. But, um, yeah, I came back to it with a book in 2018 called Suffolk Fairy Law. So, I come from the county of Suffolk in England, and so I, I wanted to look specifically at the fairy traditions of that county. And it was when writing that book that I became aware that these questions that I had, what are these beings? Where do they come from? Where, where's all this, you know, what's the origin of all this? These are questions that just weren't being asked, let alone answered. It's almost as though there was a conspiracy of silence to sort of pass over these first order questions when it came to fairies. And, and, you know, there was lots of collection of folklore and, you know, things that people had said and all this sort of etymological stuff. And, and it was all fascinating, but it just seemed to me uh, a missing piece, you know, that, that this question needed to be investigated again. And it wasn't good enough to just keep going back to Catherine Briggs and saying, well, probably 
as Catherine Briggs said, they are X and Y, because that's never a good principle on which to conduct scholarship, to, to simply give this godlike status to one scholar that, uh, you know, she was a great scholar, absolutely, and I have huge admiration for her, but no one should ever be set on a pedestal to such an extent that you don't question and you don't re-examine and you don't go back into these things. And I think that there have been a, a lot of really interesting books uh, brought out about the history of supernatural belief in, in England, which allow us to take this argument forward. I think, you know, new ways of looking at the past have come about. And I think one of those is, for example, place name studies. So a great deal of work has been done on the appearance of supernatural beings in place names by Sarah Semple, for example. And there is a huge amount of work that's been done by a scholar called Alaric Hall on elves in Anglo-Saxon England. So we have now have a much better understanding of elves. And I think also, you know, there's 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 wonderful stuff on medieval fairy belief that's been brought out uh, by Richard Firth Green. Um, Diane Perkis has done a great deal of work on this. Uh, Emma Wilby. So you know, there's all these great scholars. And you mentioned Ronald Hutton brought out a wonderful and really provocative article about this. But it, it's almost though, as though somebody needed to pull, pull it all together and really delve deep into this question of origins and see whether we can find a plausible explanation. Definitely. Now, how is the interaction, because we're talking about, for the most part, for lack of a better term, folklore, but how is the interaction between history and folklore one that might be needed to look at differently these days, particularly when we're doing things about something like fairies? Well, I am both a historian and a folklorist, there which is in, in, in some ways, you know, quite a, a good combination that sits quite well together. You know, both of those disciplines, we're looking at evidence from the past. But the difference really between being a historian and being a folklorist is that as a folklorist, you're focused on belief as something which has value in its own right, deserves to be recorded, regardless of who is expressing it. Um, you know, the beliefs of the, the common people are quite as important as the beliefs of, of the learned elites and so forth. As a historian, you're in a search for some ultimate historical truth that lies behind the narratives that, that, that you encounter. The folklorist is not really concerned with those things. But I think there are times when folklore doesn't quite have the resources to answer these first order questions about the origins of things. And that's why I, I would suggest that I was maybe the right person to write this book because I'm trained as a historian. So um, I really wanted to kind of give back to fairies or to supernatural beings, if you want to use a, a more general and, and slightly less loaded term, to give them back their history. Uh, and I think sometimes they can just appear as these kind of picturesque illustrations that pop up and we tell lovely stories about them and we we, we recount the folklore but we don't give them a history. And, and I wanted to, to, to suggest that actually there is a history that can be told. I love it. That's fantastic. I, I have to ask, though, because the name of the book is Twilight of the Godlings. What is a godling? Yeah, the name was carefully chosen. Um, another term that I use in the book that might explain what a, a godling is, is a small god. Um, now, small god is a term that was coined by the late Terry Pratchett, the the, the fantasy author, um, famously the title of one of his his best known novels. Um, and so that was, you know, uh, 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 something I borrowed. But the word godling, I, I think, is a single word that sums up this concept, and it is the concept of a being of supernatural status, quasi divine status, we might we might say, that is something less than a god but something more than human. And these are deities of nature. They're associated with the natural world. They're associated with human destiny. They don't generally have a link with the heavens. They're, so they're very much earth-based. They're often associated with under the earth. So to that extent, they would be phonic, you know, this idea of, you know, underworld uh, deities. Uh, and generally they are not the subject of a formal cult. They don't have temples erected in their honor. They don't have formal sacrifices. You know, they might have the odd offering, but they don't have a priesthood or anything like that. And so my argument in the book is that there is a, a broad category in European culture. Uh, and in particular, I was going back to look at Greece and Rome, but I think we can say this in many, many European cultures, this broad category of beings who are not quite human, not quite divine. 
Um, they are something in between. And I find them really, really fascinating because they, it, they encapsulate the human fascination with the supernatural without heading off into the realm of religion as we, as we would uh, understand it of, you know, heavenly deities. Uh, and, and so they really, they touch an aspect of the human relationship with the supernatural world that is little talked about in modern society. And that, that's why I find them so fascinating. Definitely. So let's dive into a little bit of history there for the people. I mean, of course, this is a podcast and you've just released a book and I, I can't wait to get my hands on this book. I was super excited when I finally saw like, oh, my goodness, there's a reason that Francis likes fairies. It's, there's a book coming out. So I really want uh, everybody to grab this book if this is interesting to you. Let's get into a little. Don't, don't give us the full picture, because, of course, you have to read the book. But are there any indicators of belief in godlings in Britain up to, say, let's say the, the Iron Age? Yeah, the book really sort of begins with the Iron Age, uh, okay. and that's because it's the horizon of any history, really, uh, when it comes to Britain. Uh, we have, of course, the testimony of archaeology for earlier eras. We've got these astonishing monuments like Stonehenge, but we know nothing historical about the people of that period. It's only in the Iron Age that we get the odd description of what was happening in Britain from Roman authors. The problem, of course, is that they're all foreigners describing what was happening in Britain rather than Britons themselves right. describing it. But if we put together the evidence of history, uh, the evidence of archaeology, then it seems that there are a number of different possibilities. So and one possibility is that there were indeed gods and goddesses being worshipped in Iron Age Britain, and that the Romans, when they invaded Britain, they took over those gods and goddesses, sometimes making them equivalent to Roman gods and goddesses. The most famous example is probably Sulis Minerva, the goddess of Bath, uh, the, the hot springs. And yeah, she is the goddess Sulis uh, in her native name, but she is equated by Interpretatio Romana with Minerva, the Roman goddess. And there are plenty of others like that. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that actually when the Romans uh, arrived in Britain, they encountered a religious outlook so different from their own that it required extensive Romanization before people even understood what the concept of religion was or what the concept of a god was. That it's possible that people were worshipping uh, animistically, that they were worshipping rivers, bodies of water particularly. And most of the evidence that we have for Iron Age worship in, in, in this period before the Romans arrived, and indeed after, is deposition of metalwork and other offerings in, in bodies of water. So it's possible that we're looking at some kind of animism. We know that people worshipped in groves, although they, that's almost impossible to verify archaeologically, but there is some there is some evidence of that. But we don't know. So again, there's, there's debate about among scholars about the extent to which we can know anything. But there are certain conjectures that we can come up with. Definitely. So please forgive the really cheeky way that I'm going to ask this question. But what have the Romans ever done for the origins of fairies in Britain? Well, what the Romans did, first and foremost, is provided a form of evidence which has survived in the archaeological record for what people were believing and worshipping. Um, so whereas for any other earlier era you're relying on archaeology or sort of rumours from the old Roman geographer, uh, when it comes to the Romans, certainly those Romans who could afford it were always paying for altars and votive tablets and these, these uh, stone artefacts and in some cases metal, which have, of course, survived. And so we have a huge body of inscriptions on altars recording the names of deities. And as I mentioned, some of those are double names with a native name and a, and a Roman name. And, and sometimes we encounter some really strange and interesting stuff. And something that I would highlight, and which I spend a long time discussing in the book, is the late Roman cult of Faunus in Roman Britain. Uh, and this is attested only in one hoard of treasure that was found in Norfolk in 1979. But it's a really interesting hoard because it contains evidence that there was some sort of cult with members who changed their names. So probably some kind of mystery cult focused on the god Faunus, a god who doesn't seem to have been venerated anywhere else in the Roman Empire at that time, even though the god Faunus is an ancient Latin god, 
And yet, paradoxically, it appears that he was being worshipped in the British language and not in the Latin language, which doesn't make a great deal of sense. No. And not only that, but the cult seems to have also been engaging in occult practice if we are judging by the presence of a, a number of rings and gems that are engraved with uh, Gnostic symbols, uh, you know, referring to you know, other forms of mystery cult. Now, whether there's any connection between this and later fairy lore is something which, you know, I discuss in, extensively in the book, and I won't spoil it here for those who want to read the book. But there are certain commonalities between Faunus and the later fairies, not to mention that his name is used in later sources as the Latin equivalent for the word fairy. Um, and he is, of course, a a therianthropic deity that is to say he's half animal half man much like pan in fact he, he is often interpreted as being the latin the roman equivalent of the god pan and pan has a a, a very intimate association with fairy law um over the centuries so there are yeah there are some very interesting suggestions from roman britain you've also got a cult of the parkai or i already mentioned the parkai as being these goddesses that ultimately gave their name to the to the fairies and their goddesses of destiny. So there are elements here of what we later see in fairy lore. Got it. Let's get into the big discussion here because this is kind of the, the thrust of your book, if if unless I'm mistaken, but many people see fairies. And, and I would I would wager that like even people who think that they know a lot about fairies will say this kind of thing. But they say the fairies are some sort of belief which survived the process of Christianization after Roman pagan England. So what do you have to say about this idea that fairies are a survival? Well, it's very tempting to see fairies as, as a survival of paganism. And, you know, one of the major explanations for the origin of fairies, uh, which I mentioned in the 19th century, which, you know, a lot of people would still hold to today, is this idea of fairies as degenerate pagan gods, um, as the remains of pagan gods. And I think that this is rooted in a, a commitment among folklorists and the general public to the idea of survivalism, the idea that folklore is primarily about seeking out those things which have survived from a very ancient era and have come down in some kind of garbled form to the present time. And, and, and now we can reconstruct from that garbled form what their pristine original actually was. Now, a lot of folklorists have abandoned you know, this, this, this idea, but I think it still remains quite dominant. And I think quite a lot of historians have bought into it as well. And throughout the book, I question whether this idea of survival is really the best model that we can use to try and understand beliefs in the distant past. And I, I suggest that actually it's not really, in most cases, possible to make a plausible case for survival. There are, you know, there are some examples where we maybe can say that some survival has occurred. Veneration of bodies of water and wells might be one example of that. But broadly speaking, what we're looking at is a particular kind of being, godlings, small gods, whatever you want to call them, that exists in most pre-industrial subsistence agricultural societies in Europe. Belief in this kind of being is just there, whatever they're called. And therefore, what we're looking at is a feature which is almost anthropological rather than historical of human relationships with the environment and with nature that persists. Um, so I would appeal to the idea of persistence rather than survival in the sense that I don't think you can necessarily say that folklore preserves. Um, it doesn't always work like that. Folklore is great at actually reinventing and making everything new and different, but there is this persistence of certain themes. Or another way of looking at it is the idea of niches. Uh, so within that sort of subsistence rural society, there are certain niches of belief. For example, you need a being that explains the the kind of the mishaps of ordinary life that are too insignificant for the great deities to really be concerned with. And probably the classic example of that would be the changeling phenomenon. Uh, the changeling phenomenon, I think, is in some ways particularly tragic because it, it, it's probably linked to children born with learning difficulties who were therefore said to have been afflicted by the fairies. 
But whichever society you look at across Europe, there's some sort of nature being that is ascribed the the agency of of stealing the real child and, and has substituted this changeling, which explains why this child isn't normal in inverted commas. Um, and so, yeah, this is something we find again and again and again. And whatever you, however belief changes, however society changes, assuming that you don't enter a you know a period like ours of sort of industrialized, you know, highly educated society by comparison, then some explanation related to nature spirits will be found. So that's an example of a niche that persists rather than survives. So yeah, I would I would argue that the case the case for survival is quite weak. The case for persistence is pretty strong. I love it. That's a really great way of putting it. So you say the word fairies, and this other word's going to come up. So I'm going to ask you, um, where do the Celts come in in your argument? Well, the Celts. It, uh, one answer to your question is that the Celts never existed. Um, most scholars hey. today would would say that the Celts are a, a, a are a construct of later scholarship. So if we look at those people who spoke Celtic languages, yes, there was a linguistic group which we call the Celtic languages, which was spoken in Britain, in Ireland, in Gaul, in Iberia, and various other places like um, Galatia in Turkey, in fact. Uh, it, to that extent, yes, there were Celts, there were people who spoke Celtic languages. But the idea that these people were a single unified culture or civilization is not really the case, you know, any more than we can say the Indo-Europeans were a civilization or a culture. Yes, they were a language group, they are a language group, but the fact that English is a Indo-European language and the fact that Farsi is an Indo-European language doesn't mean that there's any cultural uh, commonality there. So I, I think, yeah, it depends what you mean by Celts. If we're talking about the, the insular peoples, so the people living in Britain and Ireland, they again fall into two quite different sub language groups. You've got the Goidelic peoples living in Ireland and parts of Scotland, um, which now that word Goidelic has become the word Gaelic. And so we talk about uh, the Irish language as a Gaelic language. We talk about the, the Scottish Gaelic language, which is very closely related to the Irish language. And then you've got the, the Britonic peoples. And those are the peoples who live in Britain, but later also in Brittany, uh, which is now part of France, that pen peninsula that sticks out of the west of France. Uh, and so when we talk about um, Britain from a cultural point of view, we're talking about those Britonic speakers. Primarily, of course, the evidence that survives is mostly in the Welsh language, which developed from um, that Britonic language. So I, I think it, it's more meaningful to stop talking about Celts and to talk instead about Gaelic people, Gaelic speaking people, the peoples of Ireland and Scotland or parts of Scotland, and to talk about Britonic speaking people. So there are linguistic and cultural commonalities, very strong linguistic and cultural commonalities between the, the, the peoples of, of Wales and Cornwall, to some extent parts of the north of England as well, which are less anglicised. Yeah, I, I think those those are kind of more helpful. Now, when it comes to the idea of the Celtic, it has been a bit of a distraction with regard to fairies in that there's a perception that really takes root with Thomas Cately in the middle of the, uh, the, the 19th century, that fairies are Celtic, that this is a feature of the Celtic peoples. And this is partly a, a, a sort of logical fallacy derived from the fact that a great deal of folklore from Ireland was being published at that time and continued to be published. And a great deal of folklore was collected from Ireland. And Ireland was perceived as this kind of pristine Celtic society that had preserved the common heritage of all the Celtic peoples. But again, that relies on the fallacy that the Celts are a unified people and culture. Right. Not true. And so you end up with this idea, whatever the Irish say about fairies, presumably at some point in the past, that applied to what British people believed about the fairies. It applies to what the Iron Age Gauls and, and, and Britons thought about the fairies and all this kind of stuff. And so we end up with the idea that there's this Celtic twilight, which might be located in the Iron Age, or it might be located in the period, sort of post-Roman period, after the Roman Empire is collapsing, and you've got the the well the Arthurian period, as it's sometimes referred to rather romantically, um, in which these Celtic ideas come back, and there's the forging of a kind of a common Celtic folklore. But the reality seems to be much more complicated than that.
Definitely. Let's maybe put a little bit more detail on on this one aspect of, you know, like a you go to any bookstore and you ask them for books on fairies. The Celt, it's just, it's something it's like, ah, Celtic fairies. It's, it's all over the place. You can't really get rid of the idea and it's really tough. So we have this idea that Christianity came along in, into Britain and then the process of demonization of beliefs of the people there occurred immediately and with brutal suppressing force. So is this idea an oversimplification? Yes. I think when it, when you talk about demonization, um, it absolutely occurred. Um, so it's certainly true that Christian missionaries wanted to portray the the beings that people believed in as as demons. The primary purpose of that was to eliminate the worship of the gods. Um, so the the major gods, the the ones who were attributed a share of the kind of sovereignty over the world and over the cosmos which only the Christian God, in their view, is entitled to. So the celestial deities, the thunder gods and people like that, they're the first to go. But the fact is that there are certain deities within polytheistic pan pantheons, or, or, or to an even greater extent within animist animistic worldviews, that they serve these kind of very niche purposes uh, within nature, within fate, within folk custom, that the Christian God wasn't really covering. You know, the Christian God was very much concerned with the cosmos and, you know, the destiny of, of, of the universe and creation and salvation and all these things. Uh, whereas, yeah, it, it, the Christian God wasn't necessarily concerned with the flourishing of your crops and livestock in this particular season. Um, and so the the little the little godlings, if you like, they remain. Now there was demonization also of the godlings, but the thing about demonization is that it has it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it turns all your deities that you formerly worshipped into these evil beings, the demons. But on the other hand, it doesn't get rid of them. Because <laughs> what Christian missionaries at this period, if we're talking about late antiquity, the early Middle Ages, what they're not about is telling people that the gods aren't real. That's something which only really becomes a dominant view among Christians in the 18th century. The idea that only the Christian God exists and the other gods don't even exist, that's something which we don't get until a lot later. The earlier view taken by most of the church fathers is that the gods are real, but they were either evil people in the distant past who convinced people that they in fact were gods and, and made them worship them, or they were demons who appeared to people and made them worship them. But either way, there's going to be a small number of people who hear you say as a preacher, oh, don't worship the deities of the spring or the deities of the wood because they're demons, they're terrible, keep away from them. There'll be a small number of people, rebellious spirits, people who are uh, you know, attracted to esoteric knowledge and things like that, who will actually see that as an invitation. You know, it's kind of human psychology <laughs> um, is, is the same in every age to that extent. Work for me. And so you, you end up with this process of what I call in the book undemonization. So you demonize a group of supernatural beings, but over time they become less threatening. And a great example of this is the devil in English folklore. So the devil in English folklore is nothing like the devil of Christian dogma. The devil of Christian dogma is this infinitely evil, terrifying being who dwells in hell and so forth. Whereas the devil of English folklore is this you know, slightly sinister, but also a rather stupid being who keeps turning up to do things like move the landscape around, like, you know, move this set of hills over to this or to destroy this church steeple. Or but usually he is outwitted by a saint or even by some local uh, trickster. And so he is not really a very scary figure. He's, he's more of a figure of fun. And I think the reason for this is that an infinitely evil demonic being doesn't really make for a good story because he's just scary. And that's not what you want in a story. In a story, you want a figure that you can actually interact with on a level, if you like, as a, as a sort of a, a, a humanized figure. And so, yeah, you end up with this process of undemonization. And I think the same thing really has happened with the fairies in that they, can, they came back from the dead. They were demonized as, as bad, but then over time they become less bad as they enter into folklore rather than just the, the invective of preachers.
Definitely. That's, that's a really great comparison. Yeah. I've always loved that, uh, that little tricksterish devil. That's a, that's a, he's a, he's a wonderful, he's a great trope. I'll just say that he, everybody enjoys it. Put him in your sitcoms. He's, he's great. Uh, there's a bit of a conundrum though, with the early middle ages, as I, I don't think we can ever get like a solid idea of what happened during this period, which is why uh, many folks, myself included, consider this area very attractive to look at. Do you feel like we are able to actually know what was going on then, particularly with the regards to beliefs and spirits and small gods? No, it's it's a fascinating era precisely because we know so little about it. And it's it's perhaps the era which we can justifiably call the Dark Ages in the sense that we, we just don't have any real evidence for it. And therefore, it's it's evidentially dark uh, from that point of view. Um, so this period between the withdrawal of the Romans from Britain in 410, uh, up to the arrival of Augustine of Canterbury in, in Kent in 597. Um, so you've got this period of almost 200 years uh, where, yeah, it's, it's, it's unclear really what's going on. But we do know, of course, that a massive cultural transformation is underway. A large part of Britain, the Roman province of Britannia, is turning into England. It is turning into an area that's dominated by a, a new Germanic language that has come across the ocean, the English language, possibly with the immigration of huge numbers of, of, of people from that, that Germanic area. Uh, this is something still hugely debated by scholars. The current trajectory of scholarship seems to be swinging back to the idea of large-scale migration, after a long time where large-scale migration was, was being less emphasized, but that's a perennial kind of debate about early medieval English history. Um, we also know that these people, uh, the, the Germanic speakers, were pagan. So uh, by and large, England, before Augustine of Canterbury, is a pagan place. Yes, there are you know, odd, odd exceptions to that, but it's by and large pagan. Whereas the Britons, the people who are the descendants of the original Iron Age inhabitants of Britain, but also the Romans who stayed behind, they remain Christian in some sense. Although the extent to which they are Christian is again, you know, something which is which is debated. Uh, but there seem to be various kind of revivals of Christianity that take place among the British people, but largely because Ireland has been converted to Christianity at an early date and becomes this huge powerhouse of Christianity. And Ireland kind of recursively refreshes British Christianity in places like Wales and Cornwall and, and Brittany and the north of England, uh, which at that time was 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 largely British. Um, so yeah, you end up with this kind of British fringe, which is Christian. But in in that mix, you know, what kind of belief there was in supernatural beings is something we can only guess at, because most of the sources that we have come from the, the later medieval period. Um, and so there's a lot of extrapolation and guesswork that's involved. Let's fast forward a couple centuries. So it is been called probably one of the most important events that has ever occurred, the Battle of Hastings. But because it is such a pivotal point in the history of the British Isles, what role did the Norman conquest have with the story of, of fairies and godlings? Well, by the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, so middle of the 11th century, there seems to have been belief in a whole variety of different supernatural beings. Then the Norman conquest comes along, and then we don't hear anything really until uh, about a century later. Uh, so in the, in the 12th century, we get mentions of beings usually described as elves and they don't seem to necessarily co correspond to the picture of elves that we have in the late anglo-saxon period so my conjecture is that essentially elves become a sort of portmanteau for, for all the other supernatural beings who have reduced in sophistication and, and this sometimes happens in a in a subjugated colonized society that their their beliefs which formerly were were quite complex and nuanced they they lose their complexity and and they become simpler and more streamlined and everything that is odd everything that is you know connected to nature spirits comes into this kind of general category of 
elves. And it just so happens that that term, which before the Norman Conquest seems to have referred quite specifically to one particular category of supernatural being, it now sort of it, 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 it absorbs, it eats them, the rest of them, like a, gre a greed concept that absorbs these other, these other terms. And so we get this idea of, of elves, which is also heavily influenced now by British belief. Um, again, another conjecture which I have for this is that with William the Conqueror came a great number of Breton nobles. And these were people who spoke a language that was readily understandable by the Welsh. Um, and the marches, the, the Welsh marches, the, the, air, the rather lawless area between the Welsh and the English in what's now places like Shropshire and Her Herefordshire and Monmouthshire. This is an area where there's a great deal of Norman settlement and lots of interesting cultural interaction. Geoffrey of Monmouth, for example, the guy who basically invented Merlin, he comes out of that cultural milieu. So my, my hypothesis is that it's out of that kind of Norman Breton cultural milieu interacting with Anglo-Saxon native ideas and folklore that we get gradually this idea of a fairy law developing which is pretty consistent most of the time and it's the idea of fairies as an other an otherworldly race who live on the earth or under the earth in parallel with human beings and that they occasionally will will come out and interact with humans so we have you know stories of fairies marrying human beings they're the same size as us at this stage they're not um, they're not a diminutive size generally speaking uh, they can be monstrous or they can be beautiful one or the other usually and nowhere in between and they are responsible for for stealing children so that changeling motif is there and they are responsible for the for the fates of of men and women they they have this power over human destiny, which is equated with magic. So they, they are they are magical beings uh, who indeed can aid human magicians and can help them to, to, to learn magical arts. And so there you get into the romance tradition, you know, the, 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 the literary romances of the high middle ages. So yeah, we, we end up with a, 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 a fairly consistent fairy law by the 14th century, I would argue because it is fairy and it, uh, what i love about fairy and, and what you term godlings is that as much as there's a kind of like a belief in them on the on the terrestrial level by people living their day-to-day -day lives these things also get involved in works of art and in writing and in tales so i have to ask you is there a work of art or even um, a tale or a story which you feel incredibly important to the origins of fairies in britain Yes, if I had to pick one image, uh, which which is perhaps most illustrative of the strangeness of British fairy belief, it, it would be a woodcut that appears in 1639 in, in a, a ballad that's called Robin Goodfellow, His Merry Pranks and Jests. It, uh, it, and it's there in my book, in fact, it's it reproduced. And it shows Robin Goodfellow, who's one of the most um, well-known of, of English fairies. And He's this extraordinary figure who looks a bit like Pan. Um, he's kind of got goat-like legs and a, and, a, and a human body and horns. But he also has a, a beard, a bit like a gentleman of the period. And he's holding a candle and a broomstick and dancing around in what looks like a magic circle surrounded by other very small fairy-like beings. And what this sums up for me is the different origins of of british fairy belief in that he looks a little bit classical so there's that kind of that roman element of of, of the origins of godlings because he looks a bit like pan but he's also familiar you know he's got this ordinary beard and and looks like a looks like an ordinary gent and he's also domestic because he is holding the broomstick and the candle and robin goodfellow is particularly renowned as a kind of domestic sprite he takes up residence in your home and if you treat him well He'll clean and cook for you and things like that. But he's also dancing in a, 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 a magical circle, which is a reminder that by the early modern period, lots of um, magical practitioners, cunning folk and magicians were drawing upon the fairies and conjuring fairies, and fairies were intimately connected with, with magic. And if I had to choose one narrative that people should read above all else if they want to, to understand the origins of fairies. I would say, well, there's one um, from Walter Mapp, and this is the story of Eliodorus, or Elidor. Um, and this is a Welsh story, but it's about a, a young boy who finds himself 
he goes to sleep on a riverbank and he is drawn into the other world of the fairies. And a term that I use quite a lot throughout the book to describe fairies is otherworlders. Because I think often in medieval accounts, we encounter these otherworlders and they're not named usually. It's rare for them to be named, but they are simply these mirror images of ourselves, but they're not quite us. They are, as I said at the start, they're almost human. They're almost divine, but they're neither. And I think the story of Elidorus is is, is wonderfully um, illustrative of that idea of the other world. That's It's underground, the people are beautiful, and yet at the same time they are trapped. They, they envy human beings. We have something that they don't, in that we have a, a, a sort of a human life, a mortality that enriches our existence. They are fated to be immortal, or at least very, very long-lived, they have magical powers, but they don't have some of the things that we have. They don't, for example, they don't seem to have family life in quite the same way that we do. Um, and certainly from a medieval point of view, they don't have access to the salvation that comes through the Christian faith. So they belong to this kind of earlier pagan world. But yeah, all of those things are, are there in that story. So I'd recommend that one. When all is said and done, Dr. Young, what would you like the listeners to understand most about the origins of fairies in Britain, and dare I say, the origins of fairies within the West, besides Ireland. I think Ireland is like its own wonderful yeah. world, uh, and it's it's so fantastic. But what would you what would you want my listeners? This is literally going to be probably the last time I touch on fairies in, in quite some time. But what do you want people to understand about about these these godlings? I think I'd like people to understand that godlings are usually a, a constant across most European societies. They might have different names, but they are essentially the same insofar as they fill the same kind of folkloric niche. So whether we're talking about the elves of Iceland and Norway, or whether we're talking about the the, the trolls or the uh, the fairies or les fées of, 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 of France or the fathers of, of Italy and, and, and Spain, they're more or less the same thing. Um, and I think the other thing I would it, want people to understand is that there isn't one single simple explanation for where Britain's fairies come from. It is a very complex story. And I think I'd also like them to understand that the Romans played quite an important role in this, insofar as they formalize and try and make sense of whatever pantheon there was in the, the Iron Age, but also transmit that to that kind of dark era after the, the 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 roman withdrawal when it seems that the the more kind of basic aspects of roman iron and iron age religion persist even under the you know the overlay of of of, of christianity um so yeah and, and i think also you know as we've mentioned to kind of lay aside this idea of the of the celts and the idea that fairies are in, indelibly associated with the celts I think that's a bit of a dead end. Doesn't really get us anywhere to to say that, right? It's going to be a tough sell getting everybody to like. Hey, less looking at the Celts, more looking at uh, at the Romans. It's uh, it's a tough sell, but truthfully, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm looking at it is, and it, it and it makes quite a bit of sense. I mean, I, I have yet to read the book, but I, I was going through some of the notes uh, that I was able to pull up and. It is a it is an interesting argument that you make, and and I wish you the absolute best with it. And I I can't wait to read this book. I, yeah, I, I read that little article. Everything you know about fairies is wrong, and and I I would urge everybody to to read that as well after listening to this episode. But what's interesting at the very end of that is that you say like, of course, this idea of everything you know about fairies is wrong because you are part of the story being written right now of fairies, and I found that very beautiful. Do you do you still hold to that uh, that statement that? that not everything you know yeah. about fairies is wrong. Absolutely. And what I was really saying was that everything that you know historically about fairies is right. wrong, that the histories aren't right. But of course, it's not true, as you say, that everything you personally think about fairies is wrong, because you're welcome to think whatever you want about fairies. That's the beauty of folklore. You are part of the story. You are the folk. Anyone is the folk. We, You know, we have modern ideas of fairies which are quite different from some of the older ideas of fairies and they're they're equally part of the folklore they're part of the story they're part of the evolution of popular beliefs so you know you're you're welcome to believe whatever you want 
<laughs> Fantastic. I have to ask you the last question that I've asked every single one of my guests on the Fistful of Fairies series. And you were just in Wales. So I, I, maybe you were trying to hunt some uh, or at least search for some fairies there. But I have to ask you, Dr. Francis Young, what do you think fairies actually are to you? What do, what are what are these things? I think we need fairies. We, we, we as human beings have a relationship with nature that can easily become one of alienation. And I, and I think, you know, that, that's something that we're obviously seeing at the moment with the, the, the collapse of ecosystems and so forth. And fairies are beings that bridge that gap between our existence, our human existence and nature. And I, th I think we need them. I think we need to interact with a group of beings that are somehow between us and nature, and yet also are imbued with an aspect of the spiritual. And I think that the fact that our society doesn't give any credence and doesn't give any regard to the possibility of, of such a realm, I think is, is a, a tragedy, really. Um, I mean, when we look at some other cultures, where there is openness to that. I mean, particularly within a lot of, of Muslim cultures, the idea of the jinn, the jinn are deeply embedded within Islam um, and within Islamic cultures. And they are essentially fairies. You know, they, they are most definitely godlings of the kind that I've described. And yet, traditionally, Christian societies seem to have now done away with that idea, even though they persisted for centuries. And there are a few places you still find them, like Ireland and Iceland, for example. But largely, we've kind of abandoned this, this idea. And I wonder whether that is wise, where, you know, whether you know, there are certain perennial features of human interaction with nature that kind of need us to, um, to interact with these beings. Now, whether that means that they are real beings in the same way that badgers are real or foxes are real or the other wildlife that we might encounter. I think that's a, a less important question to, to answer because there are many, many beings that are culturally constructed that, that are part of our shared heritage of, of belief and people have interacted with those beings. I, I, don't, I don't really see the question of, you know, are fairies real as being necessarily the most important question to to ask, to be honest, but to me, they, you know, they are real as as a cultural reality in the past, and I think they're also real, almost as a necessity for us to preserve our link with the natural world. I love it. That's a fantastic answer, oh, Doctor Young. Thank you so much for for coming on the show. And I have to ask: is so if you're a doctor and you have the last name Young, do you is it like a requisite you have to study fairies? Because there's a, I start I started this introduction with, with talking to uh, Doctor Simon Young and, and Joe Hickey Hall. So is, is it like one of those things that like is is this one of those deep cart ruts that exist a niche, if you will, that uh, if you have your last name Young, you have to and doctor to begin with, you have to you have to look into fairies. I don't know what it means, uh, and Simon Young and I are not related, but yes, we, we are both very interested in, in, in fairies, um, and uh, indeed we have, we have worked together on, 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 some, on some interesting projects, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I, but there's probably some deep cosmic significance I, I somewhere. Think so. <laughs> Do you call him your fairy god brother? Is that is something that's ever come? <laughs> I don't know, but maybe I could start doing that. <laughs> Perfect. Oh my goodness. I have to ask you, uh, Dr. Francis Young, what's next for you? There was the one, two punch you had, you had magic in Merlin's realm, just everybody it's, it's, it's a cult politics in England. Do John Deeb gets brought up William Lilly, a, a ton of figures that I've never heard of before until reading this book. It's a wonderful book. And now twilight of the godlings. Uh, so uh, what's, what's next after this? Well, I am working on a, a couple of things. Um, uh, there, there will be um, further work coming out, uh, and the the general kind of area will be, you know, the history of belief, um, looking at the the persistence of pagan themes, uh, the import, the origins of folklore, those sort of things. Um, exactly what form that work will take is is not even clear to me yet. But uh, I will I will let you know when I know. Perfect. And Twilight of the Godlings, that is available through Cambridge, is it not? 
Yes, that's right. So you can order it from the Cambridge University Press website, but it's also available via other major outlets like Amazon, for example. So it, 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 it's widely available now. Um, as you as you mentioned, I think the the um, the US and Canadian release date uh, is going to be a little bit later. It's going to be in May, so it might not be available in North America until uh, a few weeks time. I can't wait to get my hands on it. It is one of those things where, uh, yeah, when when I did this series and I, and I announced it, of course you, you were like, oh, that, that's that's the let's talk about fairies. So it seems to have happened at uh, at a great time because everybody everybody seemingly paying attention to fairies. And for what reason this is, I, I don't really know. They might have something yeah. to do with it themselves. I'm not too sure, but Dr. Francis Young, thank you. So I've wanted to have you on the show for so long. And it's, it's strange that of all the things that I wanted to have you on, we're going to be, we, we decided to talk about godlings, but I think it's absolutely perfect. Uh, where can people find, uh, find you on the, uh, on the internet? Well, you can find me most easily on Twitter. So at Dr. Francis Young, uh, where I talk about fairies and lots of other things there's um, a bit of controversy can... with green man right now what's happening with yes, green man over yeah. there on the english isles is you're sparring with some people it's it's interesting to see absolutely yeah so any, any kind of controversy involving folklore i'm usually involved in it somewhere um and uh, you can look me up on my website drfrancisyoung.com of course, there will be links as to where to find Dr. Young's work, as well as a place that you can order Twilight of the Godlings, as well as uh, pre-order. If you're on uh, this side of the uh, the world, uh, please do that if this kind of thing is interesting to you, because it looks to be uh, one of those books that's going to change the game. It's going to change the fairy game. Um, I'm, I'm calling it. Uh, you heard it here first. And I have to say, for me, this was an emphatic pre-order. As soon as I saw it and I, I read the back blurb and I saw who was commenting on on how good of a book it was, I, I pre-ordered this book very quickly. So hopefully uh, you do the same. Uh, but of course, uh, those links as well as uh, the show notes for this episode are going to be available at What Magic Is This? Dot com. Uh, also, there you can find a link to my Twitter account, as well as my Facebook account and my Instagram account. Also, I should mention, you have to follow Dr. Francis Young on Twitter. It's He's very funny. Uh, he shares some of the most interesting things. I, I will say, some of the most interesting stuff that I have ever seen on Twitter have been links and things put up by, uh, by Francis. They're just the best, and he is, if you have Twitter follow Francis, please. It is, uh, he's got a wonderful account. It's, it's quite fantastic. Anyhow, uh, all of those also on what magic is this.com. Do you think that I'm doing something kind of cool here with, uh, with what magic is this and with the podcast and you'd like to support in some way, there's three ways of doing that. I'm going to run through them very, very quickly on this episode, but if you want to find out more, just head to what magic is this and find, uh, find the links for these things. The first is Patreon. That is patreon.com slash what magic is this seven bucks a month. That is it. That is the only tier. Uh, you get basically a whole different podcast. I do episodes about, uh, saints and, uh, different, uh, deities and uh, spirits. Uh, I have videos for how to do certain things like create a magical circle as well as have basically uh, how to create your own incense or do fire cleanses, things like that. And um, yeah, my, my, my show that I do for this podcast, the one you're listening to now is very different than what I do on the Patreon. I love it. I think it is my best work. I'm not just saying that because I want you to support uh, what I do here. I, I have so much fun in what I do and there's going to be a very interesting episode coming out uh, not too too shortly after this episode airs. Uh, it's going to be about something that I'm sure you know about, but uh, not the way that I'm going to tell you. Anyhow, $7 a month, that's my pitch. Please support me on Patreon. If you have the means to support and you really enjoy what I do here, please try to support my show. Um, it keeps me alive. This is my job. I spend my entire life doing this show. Everything that I do, I, I wake up about this show thinking about this show. I, I go to sleep thinking about this show. I dream about this show and uh, and the fact that, uh, yes, this is my dream. And if you want to support that dream, the best way of doing that is through Patreon. Again, patreon.com slash what magic is this? Come on over. we got a wonderful Discord server uh, that you can be a part of as well, only available to the patrons. It's all great. Um, yes, if you enjoy what I do here, 
you'll love the Patreon. Totally different, but also awesome in a different way. Uh, another way to support the show is through PayPal. Head to what magic is this? Click the PayPal links. Five dollars, ten dollars, twenty dollars, two hundred thousand dollars. Any amount helps. It all goes back to making this podcast run. Uh, yes, it keeps that hamster on the hamster wheel that runs. What magic is this? Also plays for things like my plugins. Oh, I know. I said I was just going to do this really quick, but man, I I just got I got uh, sideswiped by some news about some of my uh, some of my uh, expenses, and uh, yeah, it's. Uh, Anyways, running a podcast is expensive. I'll just say that. And if you donate through PayPal, that goes right back into making this this podcast run. I would greatly appreciate that as well. And the third way of supporting me is through merchandise. And uh, head to whatmagicisthis.com. Click on the menu. Find merchandise there. I've just put up another wonderful little logo there that I created with the Egyptian god Bastet, which is a cat. If you like cats and you love Egypt, it's a wonderful little logo. But that can go on things like mugs, notebooks, uh, stickers, fridge magnets, pens, uh, t-shirts, hoodies. Somebody just bought a hoodie of that logo that I just mentioned with Bastet. Uh, yeah, so I've got about nine designs right now, and they're all created by me, and a couple are created by a couple of other folks. But uh, yes, it is not the best way of supporting me as far as financially, but if you want to show your support and uh, you want to be the coolest person in any room that you ever enter, uh, then grab some merch, grab a t-shirt, grab a mug. Um, that's right. Uh, bring your mug to the coffee sh- uh, store. Store. Yeah, that's what it's called. It's called a coffee store. Bring your mug to the coffee shop. Um, and that's got what magic is this. And, uh, and then uh, get them to put some an Americano because everybody's drinking Americanos these days, myself included by the way. Anyhow, uh, yes, I'm drinking coffee. I, I know I, I said I didn't drink coffee, but now I'm drinking coffee. I have a girlfriend who drinks coffee, so that makes me drink coffee. Um, anyways, <laughs> I said I was going to make this short, and it's not going so well. Anyhow, uh, grab some merch. Doesn't help me very much financially, but it's great to see you supporting the show and walking around with that stuff or, or showing it off. It's absolutely wonderful. But the best way of supporting me is through Patreon. Patreon.com slash whatmagicisthis or head to whatmagicisthis.com for all of these things. And yes, for finding all of Francis's work. Francis, I think, is one of the uh, most interesting and just greatest people working. Yes, his books are just so unbelievably fascinating. Again, historian, folklorist in one package. He does great work, so be sure to check out all of his work. It is really wonderful. And also be sure to grab a copy of Twilight of the godlings but all of those things available at whatmagicisthis.com we'll see you over there fantastic this has been so much fun i i would love if some point in the future i was to ask you to come back on the show that uh, that you would be uh, okay to do so absolutely thank you so much everybody that is just a little sneak peek on the origins of British fairies, be sure to grab Twilight of the Godlings. It looks to be wonderful and one of a kind and something that we probably should have had a couple of decades ago. But you know what? It, it, it arrived uh, when when it precisely needs to, just like uh, just like those other fairy uh, like beings, wizards. Anyhow, everybody, that is the show. And that's actually truly concludes the Fistful of Fairies series. I want to thank all of my guests, particularly my guests for today, Dr. Francis Young. Until next time, everybody, we're going to be talking about some other amazing and crazy and interesting stuff like magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the world. Until then, I want each and every one of you to stay healthy, to stay hopeful, and to stay luminous. Until next time, everybody, ta-ta for now.